Thank you. Here we go. Okay, you're all set. Good morning. It is January 19th, 2022. And this is the organization meeting of the Finance Committee uh, following the election of the council that was sworn in on January 3rd, 2022. Uh, I'm going to begin the meeting by um, just giving some opening statements, calling the meeting to order. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, this meeting is being conducted via remote means. Given that we have a quorum of the finance committee of present, I'm calling the January 19th, 2022 meeting of the committee to order at uh, 9.04 a.m. I'll call upon each committee member uh, and including our members that are the non-voting residents. And at that time, I'd like you to unmute your mic and say present. And I'd also like you to just tell us in a sentence or two, your interest in the finance committee, what brings you here today? Okay, so I'm going to start with, um, oh, hi, Alicia. How are you? Uh, I'm going to start with actually myself, Lynn Griesmer. Uh, I'm president of the Amherst Town Council. Uh, finance has always been my kind of sweet spot. And so uh, and it's a role that I have served with nonprofits and uh, been very interested in my own professional life. I'm going to then go to say to um, Michelle Miller. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I, I, hopefully you can hear me and um, nice to see you all. And yeah, I'm, I'm uh, interested on multiple levels um, to learn. Uh, and I think I, I have some things to bring to the to the committee as well. Um, at the MMA orientation, we went to our former finance director, Sandy, I'm not remembering his last name, great, he gave an excellent presentation um, that really sparked my interest. Um, so thank you. Um, Kathy Shane. Hi, everyone. Um, this will be my, I guess, new term. We're on fourth year on finance. I'm My training is as an economist. <clears throat> um, so right from the get-go, I wanted to be uh, understand the town's finances, budget constraints, the way we do capital. And uh, so this committee has always been my top priority. Okay. Andy Steinberg. Hi. Uh, I've had a long time interest in town finance. Uh, and as Lynn did, I started out in nonprofit management leading into uh, uh, the financial issues that uh, really um, are similar when you come down to what the goals are of a town to try and use limited resources to um, identify and serve the greatest and highest goals and to try and see what we can do to expand resources. I was on the prior uh, finance committee that existed under town meeting and chaired it for several years and I uh, have been on the finance committee along with Kathy from the uh, formation of the council and uh, was chair during those three years. Okay, uh, and Alicia Walker. Hi everyone, um, I'm Alicia Walker. Um, I think, so my general interest is in math um, I do do the finances at the law firm where I work, and so I'm really interested in learning it on a bigger scale, um, and just because um, everything is sort of dependent on finances, so I'm just really interested in learning the processes in which we use here. Okay, Bob Hegner. Hi, I'm uh, one of the three resident members of the uh, finance committee. Um, I actually am in my third year on the committee. Um, and uh, I've uh, been, I started out uh, very interested in, in the town's finances. I come from the private sector, which gives me a little bit different background than most people. Um, and I just want to keep continuing to provide uh, my input to uh, the issues that the committee wrestles with. Great. Uh, Bernie Kubiak. 
or a no wait, H Holloway, Matt Holloway. I'm sorry, <laughs> trying to go alphabetically here. Hi, Matt. Morning. Uh, I'm Matt Holloway. I'm another resident member of the committee. Uh, I just joined in November. Um, I am a uh, fairly new resident in Amherst. I'm the parent of a two year old, uh, first time homeowner, um, and very interested in you know, this ambitious and exciting financial um, outlook that we have for the town and, and thrilled to be a member of this committee. Um, I work in public education in a, in a school district currently. Um, previously, I worked in at the state level in public education. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I really enjoy the work of this committee. I'm happy to be here. Okay. And uh, Bernie Kubiak. Good morning, Bernie Kubiak. Um, I'm a local government junkie having, uh, held some local positions as a selectman and a county commissioner and have the dubious distinction of having managed uh, three smaller towns um, after a long, um, almost 30 year career in human services, nonprofit management. Um, I'm trained as a historian and a, as a policy wonk. Uh, this is either my second or seventh year on the finance committee, depending on when you, if you count the tenure from the old one. Um, I, it's, it's always a thorny issue. There's always more demand than there is funds. And what the town does in terms of finances really reflects what the town is and how the town chooses to operate and treat its uh, citizens. So I look at this as a key position and uh, as a way of my giving back to, uh, to the town of Amherst as well in terms of providing my labor. I also want to welcome uh, Sean Mangano and Sonia Aldrich, who work with us on a regular basis and help staff this committee. Uh, I think that's a, a word that basically so underestimates what they really do for us. So I want to just say that they're really an integral part of how we move forward. And then we have guests today, Chief Nelson and assist, uh, Assistant Chief uh, Lindsay Strongroom. And then also we have our Bill Kazin, who is our minute taker, and Athena, who is clerk to the council. So with that, we are going to move to the election. Oh, excuse me. I have a few more things I have to say uh, based on uh, this being a virtual meeting. Uh, there's no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let the chair or me or the minute taker know uh, when you have a question or you want to respond to something, please use the raise hand function. And if there are technical difficulties and you lose connection, we will decide what to do at that time. And we may have to take a pause in the meeting or at least note it in the minutes. Okay. So with that, my one and only other job, besides myself being a member of the committee, uh, is to... Um, conduct the election for chair of the finance committee. So the floor is open for nominations or volunteers. Michelle Miller. I'd like to nominate Andy Steinberg. Okay. Andy, do you accept that nomination? Yes, I do. Okay. Are there any other nominations or volunteers? Okay, then I am going to do a roll call vote since we're virtual, we have to do that. And your vote is in favor of Andy as chair or opposed. And I will also ask for the opinions of the non uh, voting residents as well. So starting with myself, uh, I, I support Andy as chair. Um, let's see, I'm going to go next to Um, Michelle Miller. Aye. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Mich uh, Alicia Walker. Yes. And also then I'm going to go to Bob Hegner. I support it. Uh, Matt Holloway. Support. Bernie Kubiak. I really like Andy. And in spite of that, I agree that he should be chair. <laughs> A little humor at this hour of the morning is always appreciated. Andy, with that, I'm turning the meeting over to you. I did not write a script for this meeting. 
Um, and so uh, if there's any questions as because I'm a member, I'll be here, but I would be here as president for this first meeting anyway. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Lynn. And I wanna thank the, the committee for kind words and confidence uh, in my continuing as chair. Uh, what I propose that we do is um, finish the election of officers to um, elect a vice chair and then um, proceed uh, in the agenda to um, action item five, um, the part uh, A that has to do with the uh, pumper truck because uh, that way we can uh, let our chief and deputy chief of the fire department get on to other work unless they want to stay with the meeting, which is of course they're welcome to, but to preserve their time, uh, we um, take the, that item out of order if uh, there's no one who uh, objects to doing so. So um, with that said, um, are there any nominations um, or self-nominations for vice chair? Kathy. Um, I, I would like to nominate myself. I've enjoyed being vice chair and working with Andy. So I uh, will appreciate that. And then I don't have to ask whether you accept the nomination since you made it yourself. Uh, are there any other nominations? Um, since there are no other nominations, then I think we can just proceed to a vote under the same process that was before, which is um, an indication of um, yes or from the uh, resident members of the committee, whether they will, uh, what their opinion or support is for the motion that's on the floor to um, like reelect Kathy as vice chair, and I will stick with alphabetical order, but since Lynn voted first last time, this time we'll start with Bob Hagner. I support Kathy. Uh, Ed Halloway. Support. Uh, Bert Bernie. I really like Kathy too, so I support the nomination. Uh, Michelle. Yes. And Kathy? Yes. And I vote yes. Uh, Alicia? Yes. And Lynn? Kathy, and thank you, Kathy, for being willing to do this again. Yes, and I want to um, also thank Kathy. And um, we'll talk about minutes in a little bit, but I really do want to uh, thank Kathy for. Um, two things that she did above and beyond um, uh, during the last um, council. One was that she was really a great sounding board and, uh, for me and a great person to um, look over reports and uh, uh, sort of allow you know, me to bounce the wording on reports um, off of somebody who's an extraordinarily good writer and good and very thoughtful person. And uh, second thing she did is really move uh, our minutes through the process. And we will talk about that a little bit later because I think we need to um, refine and revise the minute process and take uh, that burden a little bit away. I think it's unnecessary to have uh, Kathy do quite as much as she did before, but I really appreciate that she did so much. So with that said, I'm going to go back to um, either Sean or Sonia, whoever is prepared to do this and um, give us a um, brief explanation of um, proposed financial appropriation and transfer order 20, FY2205D. And um, as you do so, um, 
maybe I should for just a second uh, explain to the uh, newly elected members of the council who've not experienced the word order before. Um, in city form of government, um, this kind of inaction when it comes before the council is referred to as an order. And um, the, the uh, numbering system and the wording of the orders comes for, is proposed to us from staff, uh, most frequently from Sonia. And uh, we consider the, uh, both the wording and the intent of the proposed order and whether we recommend it to the council. Um, there are two orders that we need to deal with, but I wanted to um, at least address the first one so that the chief and deputy chief can uh, uh, choose to leave if they wish. Um, Sean or Sonia, can uh, one of you uh, uh, begin with the explanation? Yeah, would thanks, Andy. Like, would you like me to put the order up, Andy? If you have the order, yes, uh, that would be helpful because I'm not sure that everybody has seen it. And Andy, if it's okay with you, do you mind if I just, I'll do the first order on the fire pumper and then see if there's questions and then do the next one after that? Yes. Okay. Yes, we want to do at least that one right now. Okay. So both of these projects are, um, are capital projects that were approved in the past. And in both situations, for different reasons, the cost has come in higher than what was approved. Um, so we're bringing this request back to the council um, and to finance committee for review um, to request the additional funds that are needed in order to complete the project. So the first one is the fire department pumper truck, which was approved in FY22. Um, the estimate back then was 450,000. And for a variety of reasons, um, vehicle inflation, the estimate was I think a little bit out of date and the additional options that um, the fire department, when they looked at the, the state contract for this truck, um, the options that they added, which in reviewing those options makes sense, and you'll see the, the main ones here, um, brought the price of that truck to $637,000. So it's an, we're requesting an increase of $187,000. The, the way we're purchasing this is through um, an MAPC or Metropolitan Area, I think Planning Council. It's a state contract. Um, where they go out and they get pricing for these trucks because they're very specialized vehicles. So they work with other fire departments to figure out what type of things are needed and then they bid it out. And then we have access to their pricing when we go out to buy a truck. So it saves us from having to do an individual bid and it kind of, it brings the collective buying power of multiple fire departments together. Um, so that's how this was priced out. And when um, the chief and, and his staff went to price out the vehicle that they they want to purchase and this is a vehicle that we'll have for 20 years so it's a it's a large investment that we want to make sure it's um you know it meets the needs of the town for 20 years going forward um that that price came in quite a bit higher as you can see um, some of the options that i think are noteworthy um that are key for this again 20-year vehicle um, there are a couple of major things to allow the pumper truck to act as an emergency response vehicle allows it to carry um, emergency medical staff and also their um the, the equipment and the supplies that they need. So they need refrigerated um, cabinets and things like that for their supplies. It has all of that functionality. Um, and then the other two big pieces, it has a generator. So if there's anything where, um, you know, an emergency scene needs lighting or anything like that, where they need to light up the scene, it's late at night, um, this vehicle will have the ability because of the generator to put up those lights and power those lights um, for the duration of the event. And then the other large thing that was a uh, addition here is the um, larger pump capacity, um, which allows the, the pump to either push out more water faster, or I think also to, could receive water faster. Um, and then there's just some things that, you know, when we looked at the base price for this vehicle, it was pretty close to the $450,000 estimate. But surprisingly, you know, the base price doesn't include some simple things like vehicle safety equipment for the, for the staff, for the, the responders that ride in the, the cab of the, of the vehicle. It doesn't, the base price doesn't include things like airbags. So um, there's a number of things like that, that we felt, again, being a, a long-term investment that we needed to add to this vehicle um, to make sure it meets our needs going forward. And then I offer, if Chief Nelson or um, Assistant Chief uh, Stromgren want to add anything, might be a good time for that. Sure, thanks. Uh, 
It's going to add Anna McCook a couple things. Uh, uh, it's got it's going to have the uh, zero R R R R RPM feature that uh, we have on our new AM AM AM. AM. You know, it's, it's, it, 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 but it is uh, uh, it, it's, it's right. I I age link for the X amount of, amount of time. It'll shut 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 itself stuff down. Run run on bad, bad batteries. Uh, which, which is a, a you know a pretty green green feature, but that's that that that's an expensive item. The other one, of the other features we're we're going to have uh, built built in is an in intercom system uh, within 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 the cab. Uh, that's uh, head 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 headset my 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 pulse system. Uh, one one of the big big things still one of the big big things in, in the fire fire service is exposure to the uh, noise and engine engine, engine noise exhaust noise and uh, deg, deg, deg degradation of hearing hearing is a big problem pro problem still in the fire fire service this this will address address that long you know long term exposure to extreme extraneous noise. So it's uh, it's you know it's built and it'll come built built in as part part of the system part part of the engine. We're actually actually re retrofit sitting. We we uh, recently re re recently were awarded, awarded a grant where we we're, we're going to re retrofit uh, to to two of our front front line engines uh, with with this same intercom system. Uh, and they're not and it's not it's not cheap. So. That, uh, that that type 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 of thing. Linz, do you want to add in, in anything? Sure. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Great. Yeah. I think Sean summarized it pretty well. Um, you know, the biggest thing is our original request was in fact out of date. We've been more focused on the new ambulance and the new ladder truck. Uh, those prices we have kept up with. Uh, it was unrealistic to expect to get a pumper for four hundred fifty thousand. In 2022, when we spent 424 back in uh, 2014, so we, you know, that was that's on us that we did not keep the uh, prices up to date. Then on top of that, as Sean said, there's been price increases. In fact, within the state bid that he mentioned, they are allowed to raise the prices based on market value, and there was a four percent increase last spring, a four percent increase in November. And there's, believe it or not, a 6% increase coming next month. Fortunately, uh, if we move this forward, we will get in under that 6%. So we will not be looking at a 6% increase if we move forward with this. So those, that's some of the biggest challenges, simply been the market and the uh, price increases on top of the original appropriation, unfortunately, being out of date. And then also the additional features that uh, the chief and Sean mentioned. But this price is, at this point is firm. If we move ahead with it in the next month, the uh, vendor has guaranteed that. Andy, I can't raise my uh, hand. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I was just about to ask for raised hands to see um, if there are questions about the proposed purchase in the, the truck itself. And then, um, I'll have um, going to turn to the actual wording of the order if that's available. Uh, so uh, Lynn, and then I think I saw Bernie's hand momentarily. Um, first of all, I'm in stick, sticker, sticker shock, but what I'm really pleased to see is the added things that have been brought forward and especially as we work to try to get to um, a zero car, our, our sustainability goals. Uh, will this be located in Central or North Fire Station? And when we build South Fire Station, where will it go? It'll be in sense, in sense Central. And then uh, when we build the new station, it'll be in, the, in, that, in that station. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to start by thanking Chief Nelson for continuing on with us. We've uh, we've benefited from his leadership uh, for years and hopefully for a few more to come. 
Um, is, is this a piece of equipment Thank you. replacing uh, a piece of equipment or is this an add-on? It's a, it's a, a, a replay, play, play, play. So is there, there's some so salvage play, 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 stand, 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 standard. Uh, it, weird, uh, Lindsay, Lindsay, do you want to, want to address, address that? We, what really, what, what we do, we, we move, we, you know, we, uh, replay, play, replay, place one and then move, move each, each truck back in, into, to, to, to a reserve, reserve, reserve status. status. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, the trading value of these vehicles is negligible for the ambulances we're getting about $1,500 maximum for a pumper like this. It, the truck that we're actually going to get rid of will be a 1999, so it'll be 23, year old, 23 years old about at the end of its life. Uh, we might get uh, one to $2,000 for a trade-in, which we would typically just put towards putting new radios into it, but unfortunately, they're not worth any more than that. <laughs> it's probably worth more as uh, scrap steel. Thank you. Yep. Actually, 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 what happens a lot of times is that you would all end and end 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 up being being sent 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 to some some play, play, place around 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 the world, uh, a kind of country that 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 need need that need need need, need a fire fire truck. They'll 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 sell sell it to some to some 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 place. So. Andy, do you want me to speak to the funding source real quick? Uh, yeah, I have two two quick questions, sure. um, and then uh, we'll turn to the funding source, which really uh, would be covered by the wording of the order, which is why I was asking about the wording of the order. But um, I'm assuming, and so we don't need to go into a long discussion about it, that uh, the width of the truck is appropriate for use at the central station. Um, and that that's been calculated and we're, we're comfortable with that. And uh, the second is uh, just to know where we are in the cycle of purchases. Have we bought anything since the uh, Quint was purchased when uh, John Musanti was uh, town manager? Yeah, I can speak to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, go, yes, go uh, in terms of the size uh, width, uh, pretty much is regulated by DOT. They can't be any wider other than the mirrors. So yes, width is okay. Height is a big factor for us. Uh, it will be built to our spec to fit into the very low doors of Central Fire Station. We are able to make it longer to accommodate a more cab space. So that's what we're doing. And to answer your question, Andy, the second one, uh, yes, we bought our last pumper in 2014. Um, and the Quint was purchased in 2009. Okay, so just wanted to give everyone an idea of what the uh, duration of purchases has been with this history of purchases. Kathy. Um, I, I just a uh, quick question. You said we're actually kind of custom ordering these. Do you have any sense, and this is a longer term, not on this project, if we had regulation door heights, if we had didn't have to custom it, would the price be lower? Or, and some magnitude, like a few percentage points, big difference. How much does the custom matter? Um, well, first of all, custom is sort of a misnomer in terms of how we're thinking about it. Pretty much every pumper that anybody buys is called a custom pumper because okay. they are built to all of our specifications because every fire department, sorry about the noise, wants something different. Um, in terms of the height question, yes, it has a small factor. Um, probably a very small percentage price-wise, what it, what it limits us on what is we can actually do with the pumper in terms of features more than actually a cost difference. Thank you. Yeah. Andy? Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm ready to make a motion if you're ready for that. Uh, actually, we have one more thing we have to do um, before we get to the motion, and that is that um, if Sean or Sonia have the actual order that's being proposed available, then we would need to get um, one of them to put it on the screen. And it's, if not, yeah, it's in this uh, memo at the end. Page four. Yeah, page four. Okay. Then uh, can you get down to the bottom of the memo so that people can see the wording of the order? I think, Lynn, it's your document. It's, yeah, it's on there now, and, I think. Andy, it's on the screen. 
it might just take a minute okay. to update. There it is. All right. So I make a motion to recommend to the town council that they approve appropriation and transfer order FY 22-05D. Shane seconds. Yeah, we've been in motion that's been seconded. The order addresses the um, where the source of the funds is. So I don't know if you want to say anything more about that, Sean. Yeah, I'll just say that um, you know we we talked about whether we should pull from free cash or or increase the borrowing authorization. I think we felt based on the conversations of this committee in the past about um, reserve levels and and where they are currently. And also that these are one-time costs. We look to free cash instead of increasing our borrowing um, because we know we have some significant borrowings coming in the future. Okay. Um, you know, I don't know if uh, Alicia or Michelle have any questions that they want to ask about um, the terminology or whether the uh, training program that you referred to that Sandy Pooler led cover those topics sufficiently and uh, so I'll give you a moment to see if you want to raise your hand and ask any questions and then if you don't I'm going to go ahead and ask for a vote on the motion that's on the all of my questions have been answered so thank you okay seeing no hands and uh, indication of that um, the uh, continue on with the um, Andy, Alicia has, has her hand raised. Right. Alicia has oh, her hand Alicia, I'm sorry. Sorry, it took me a minute Alicia. to find the, the virtual hand. Um, I just wanted a quick clarification. So this um, order, we're just, I mean, we're passing this to the town council for approval of the 187 from the free cash. The other amount is already taken care of? We'll do that one next. Um, okay. the, the school one we'll do after, um, right after this one. Okay, thank you. Right. Or were you asking about the 450, the, the original purchase amount? Yeah, the original purchase yeah. amount. Oh, that, so that was already, um, that was voted back um, in June of 2021, um, that, that initial amount, the 450,000 for the pumper. Okay, and so that, those fund, that yeah, funding those... is already set aside, it's already taken care of, they just need the increase. Exactly, yep, okay, the funding's there, you. yep. Thank you. So, uh, Bob has his uh, hand. Bob, do you have your hand up? Yeah, sorry, I, I should have thought of this earlier. Uh, Sean, is it possible to to take the 187 from the ARPA funding, or does it have to come from free cash or some other source? Um, it could come from ARPA funding. I think right now we've got plans for how we propose to use the ARPA funding. Um, okay but theoretically it could. Yeah. Anything else? If not, then uh, let's go ahead and uh, proceed in the same way we did before with uh, resident members indicating whether they support the motion and actual votes from uh, council members. And uh, this time, Continuing the alphabetical presentation, but starting one down, uh, we'll start with uh, Matt. Uh, I support. Bernie. Support it. Uh, Michelle. Yes. Uh, Kathy. Yes. And I'm a yes. Um, and. Uh, Alicia? Yes. Lynn? Aye. And uh, Bob? Uh, yeah, I support it. I think these, uh, these additional features are very well thought out and will be very uh, useful both to the fire department and to the town. Okay, so then the motion uh, carries unanimously with support of uh, the three resident members of the committee. And uh, I want to thank the, uh, uh, Tim and uh, 
Lindsay, for having been here. And uh, you, as noted, you're welcome to uh, remain in the meeting. But uh, if you have other business to take care of for the day, we understand and appreciate you were here. Uh, I just, so, I just want, to, want to say say thanks for you, for you appreciate the uh, support for the for, for the bar 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 bar. We really appreciate for you. So thank you. And I want to thank Lindsay for taking us on a train ride. <laughs> It's, you, a new, you're it's a new Zoom background that they offer the train ride. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. Just trying out the just trying out the Valley Flyer on my way to New York. Great. All right, thanks a lot. Okay, so um, on the agenda, since we're um, into the uh, two financial orders, um, would I guess it might make sense to just go ahead and. Uh, talk about the uh, proposal for additional funding for the elementary school feasibility study. And um, I don't know if, uh, um, Kathy, you'd like to introduce the topic as chair of the committee or whether you'd like Sean to introduce it. Um, uh, I'll just say a few words, but then Sean sh should go into the details because he's actually been at the table with this. Um, we this we're in the feasibility stage and the town had as the memo said originally done a best guess of what this would cost both for our owner's project manager and for the designer services and this is the phase where we are comparing options um, we're not yet designing the school so we're comparing options there's a lot of work on the building and the sites to determine what can be built there um, and particularly as we've got a net zero bylaw that we will building, be building, trying to be extremely energy efficient and move away from fossil fuels. So there needs to be exploration of both sites, both Wildwood and Port River. So as you can see in the memo, the estimate of, of the, what it would cost was lower than we, it turns out to be lower than what we're finding both the length of time we thought we would save some time and money because we had done a Wildwood study and we'd done a Fort River study, but they did not look at some of the things we are now going to be looking at in this, including traffic studies for both um, detailed traffic studies uh, flow, not just at the gateway to the schools, but also geothermal capacity and uh, solar capacity with Fort River being one of the sites and actually it's named as the site but we're looking at both sites we will have to be taking into account wetlands um, if we end up saying that's a preferred building site so sean you can go through some of the elements but all of this ended up meaning that the this feasibility stage is more expensive than we thought sure um so for for some history, when we were in the MSBA pipeline the first time back around 2014, 2015, we had budgeted $1 million for the feasibility study. Um, and we, with the contracts we had signed for the designer and for the OPM and for the construction manager, we were pretty up against it with that million. That was a pretty good estimate at that point. Um, and so when the, when that project obviously didn't come to fruition, we came back to request funds for the second feasibility study. Um, there was hope and um, at the time that we could reuse the, some of the work from that feasibility study back at Wildwood and then also the Fort River site, um, which is why the $750,000 estimate was brought forward. There was no certainty that we would be able to reuse those studies or that we would save money, but I think the, the hope was that we would be able to at that time. Um, we didn't really, we weren't able to get a good cost estimate or, or figure out whether that estimate was appropriate until we were able to get the OPM and the designer on board um, because they're the ones that really dive into what materials were in place from the prior studies um, and also work with their, their sub consultants to figure out what their pricing is right now. Um, and in addition, as you all know, building costs have gone sort of through the roof and a lot of the way designers and OPMs build their fees is it's usually a percentage of construction. So if construction costs are going up, designers and OPMs also increase their fees, uh, you know, usually in the, the same percentage. So this new budget that we that's on the, um, actually, then if you scroll down a little bit, 
there's a breakdown, a detailed breakdown that we've worked on with our designer and with our OPM that really gets into the, the individual contracts or pieces of the feasibility study that we'll have. Um, so we, we've asked, we told them like, we don't want to come back again. We want to, this is, we need the sort of, what is the, the true cost going to be for this going forward up until the point where we vote on a, a full building project. Um, so they dug in and worked with their consultants to get uh, as accurate a numbers as they could. Um, they've built in a little contingency there that you see, just so again, we don't need to come back. Um, we're hoping to bring it in under the 1.3 um, or, or 1,030,000. Um, we hope not to use the contingency. There's a couple of things in here that we won't spend unless Fort River is selected as a site. You can see a couple of those marked um, at the bottom. As Kathy mentioned, there are some new costs from the last time around when we did this feasibility study around um, energy sustainability enhancements. So the geo, there's a lot more in terms of geothermal because that might be a, a major component of this project. Um, there's money around solar because that would, you know, an almost, almost certain will be a, a part of this project. Um, and then the other cost that's um, depends on which way we go is the construction manager. So there's two ways to um, procure building or contractors for these projects. You can either do a construction uh, or a CM at risk, construction manager at risk um, option, or you can do design bid build. Um, and if you do the CM at risk, usually um, it's a more smooth procurement process, but it, it also costs a little bit more, which is why that money is there. But that decision hasn't been made by the school building committee yet. Um, so we're hoping to bring it under that number, but we wanted to bring the full uh, most up-to-date estimate to the to the council, to the finance committee. Um, and and we do not anticipate having to come back at any other point up until the up until the time where we ask for the the vote on the full project. So, Ed, are there any questions from the committee? Bob. Yeah, the question I have is for the Fort River site and whether we know where the 100 and 500 year floodplains are there, uh, because I think we need to know that information before we would do any construction. Kathy, do you wanna weigh in on that? I think our recent yep. information is that water will be an issue, um, but um, not a issue that maybe prevents a project, but it will be an issue there. Um, yeah, the, 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 those lines have been redrawn, Bob. They, they haven't, I think, been officially posted yet, but Chris Brestrup gave them to the designer and they are definitely worried about and focused on that as an issue. And they, um, they've they been out, they were out over Christmas and New Year's doing both geotechnical borings, but sort of better sense of where it might be possible to build, um, you know, whether it's a building new or add reno, but also the question has come up if, you know, with a solar array, there's, we have a lot of land there. Where can a solar array be near those 500 year floodplain? And that's going to be a question they're going to be talking to with the conservation committee. You know, so if the building itself isn't there, can some part of what the renewables would be, be how close can they be? So both those play in in two ways to this, the feasibility of that site um, for this building. And can I just say, just to add to that, on the seventh uh, of January or the twenty first of I mean February, on the either the seventh or the twenty first the flood maps that have been developed, which we have to do every 10 years, will come before the council for approval. Yeah, so, you know, so what they were given, I think is the same thing we're going to see, Lynn. So it was unofficial, but those are the ones that have been redrawn. So they were all, actually, when they were bidding, they were all given the updated flood maps. Um, so they could at least tell us whether we had two prospective sites or whether there was going to be a major restriction on the Fort River site. Matt? Thank, thanks, Andy. And um, I apologize if this is a little basic. I just I want to make sure I understand the um, the bulleted items, Sean, that I that are on this list. So traffic study, solar, permitting, hazmat, and contingency. 
if I track those down in the um, revised budget down below and then add up those items, should that be the difference between the million thirty and the seven hundred fifty thousand, or is there additional? Is, is that how the um, accounting works here, or or is there additional? Not a, not exactly. There's some. So the contracts for so our original appropriation was for seven hundred fifty thousand. Um, we have a contract with the designer for basic services for five hundred thousand, and uh, the OPM for one hundred ninety six thousand, as you can see there. Um, so that adds up to six hundred and ninety six thousand. Um, so we have a little bit left in the original appropriation of 750 that we can put towards some of these things. Um, so basically, it'll be these things. If you see this list, minus the 750 that we already have is what the additional appropriation is for. Okay. And so the additional appropriation itself is the 280,000. Yeah. And, and so these are the main, these five bullets are the, the large things, but there's, as you can see below, there's a number of smaller um, smaller things. Oh, okay. All right. Michelle. Thank you. I'm, I'm trying to think about how to ask this question. So uh, bear with me. Um, and Sean, you may have already answered it, but if any one of these line items are to come in less, so if the traffic study costs 30,000, for example, um, there's no, there's no single entity that's getting this a million dollars that's right. just capturing it. Okay, so any one of these can be reduced. If yeah, if this comes in less, the money will flow back, um, flow back into the to the town's um, capital funds or to um, the town's coffers. It won't. Um, we don't give this money out until it's until there's a contract in place. That being said, we did ask the designer and the OPM to figure out, a, you know, as accurate a cost as they can. Um, so most of the cost estimates on here are pretty close to being exact. The, the main difference will be if there's some things we just don't have to do. Um, for Like if, if Wildwood is selected, then we'll definitely come in $27,000 under because we won't have those costs um, at the bottom. Um, so, but, you, but to your point, yes, if we don't spend all this, it'll come back to the town. Okay, great. And so the contingency will sort of be the, that's the catch-all in case right. any one of these items are or higher than we yep. think. Okay. And a lot of that is around the timeline. Um, as Kathy mentioned, we were hoping this project would be a little bit shorter than where it is currently. And with these projects, time is money. Every month more that we we go, we're, you know, we have to pay for consultants to stay on and provide services and things like that. So um, some of this is the contingencies around the timing and make, making sure we hit our timeline that we're on. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think that it's just important to note that um, we really, uh, for the most part, authorize expenditures, but the actual expenditures um, don't happen unless they need to and they're expended. And money that's authorized but not spent um, just remains within the source where it came from. Um, I think that uh, Bernie and uh, thanks, Andy. Um, I, I'm I'm not surprised that the engineers don't like the results of our previous engineering studies because uh, they're always my experience are always uh, um, unwilling at some to some level to use the results that other firms have done at other times. So it's not surprising. The question on this is if if the, you're studying the feasibility of the Fort River site, um, if the Fort River site's chosen, it's going to impose other costs on the project. Um, I'm thinking of, you, you got to do something with the kids. Well, the old building is being refurbished or the uh, uh, or being torn down for the new one. So are those additional costs included in this study or does that come later? That would be part of the pro. Those types of things will be looked at as part of the study, but though, like the cost of it, if there is a cost, um, would be part of the next phase of the project, the actual construction and. Okay, because um, we, we we know from all the previous work we've done that if we do anything with Fort River, it's gonna we're gonna have to have temporary classrooms. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think phase. it depends. It depends on what you know what the the staging and phasing of the project is. With Wildwood, I remember there were options where you know, even when they done demoed some of the building, some of the building was open and they were able to keep some kids in that part of the building. 
Um, but you're right, and most most likely it will cause some disruption that might have a cost um, to the project. Okay, thanks. Kathy? Um, to, to the question you just asked, Bernie, I would be glad, and I can send it to the whole committee, there's an evaluation criteria list, a pretty long list that would com be comparing both sites. And what you just asked is one of the cost factors, you know, the duration of the construction, can we, you know, moving the kids to another site. I visited one school that Dinesco did um, that's just opened, you know, um, about a year ago. And they were able to build a new school eight feet away from the existing school without ever having to move the kids. You know, so 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 some of what they're looking at is what what how many what's the size of the new place? Will it be ad reno? Will it be new? And we're going to have side by sides with cost estimates on all of that before we get to what are we doing. So you'll see that in the next phase, those costs, but they are also a factor in us making a decision. Okay, that that would having that list would be helpful and it might um uh, to be frank i look at the fort river site as a loser um and i'm sorry that we have to spend money on it um i've been through constructing three schools um so uh, fortunately none of them had to be next to each other <laughs> but i would appreciate a list of a list of criteria that would be helpful thank you kathy Any other questions at this point? Because otherwise, so we should uh, turn to the order itself and then uh, see if there's a motion. I think the one other thing, Andy, I'll say real quick is, um, it, you know, when we're planning for these four building projects for the schools, we had um, we had estimated eighty million for the school project. Again, that's a pretty high level estimate. We'll get much more detailed estimates coming up, but. Um, working with the designer and the OPM, they didn't feel that this additional request is going to um, change that estimate that we had originally of 80 million. Um, the estimates they've used, or at least initially, came in a little bit lower than that 80 million. So, so we're not anticipating this will impact uh, the projection that we had for the four building projects. Okay, um, which gets to topic that I wanted to get to later and then I see uh, we have another hand up another question but um, at some point I think we need to find out whether um, newly elected counselors uh, would like to have a presentation of the funding plan that was developed for the major projects and whether that should happen at a, if so whether that should happen at a finance committee meeting or in some other forum, uh, council meeting or retreat. So uh, at some point we do need to think about that because uh, otherwise uh, I, I don't wanna uh, have the new counselors uh, behind the other counselors and understanding uh, and knowledge about how the funding plan was developed and what it is. And I guess the other pieces, whether you've done any modifications anyway since it was last presented because of changes in costs. Yeah. Alicia? Um, yeah, so I do think that if we could get a presentation or see the funding plan, that that would be extremely helpful. Um, and then also I have just a similar question to my question before, and if this is just asking for the increase, so the other amount of the funds are already taken care of, and then just a little bit of clarification on Sean's previous statement that this isn't going to affect the overall estimate. And so um, how is that possible if this is a different estimate than before? And then also it says here that we'd be looking to take this from the free cash as well. And so if in that, sorry, I don't know if I can see it here anymore because the order is moved down or was I looking at something else? Yeah. Right now on the screen is- Yeah, uh, if it can going. go down just a tiny bit more. Um, so it's the 5% of the budget. If that is taking into consideration the other amount that we just um, were talking about taking from the free cash for the fire truck. Good. Could I respond to those, Andy? Thank you. Yes, please. 
Um, so I'll just start with the last one first. So yes, this uh, the four point four five percent that will be the um, what's left over. That's if both appropriation requests are approved. Um, so it does take into account both the pumper and the school. Um, and yes, this again, the, um, we're just requesting the two eighty for the school. The seven fifty was already approved back in um, February of twenty twenty two. It was uh, quite a while ago because um, it had to be approved before anything started. Um, so that. So this is just requesting the additional funds. Um, and I do think one of the things I, th I think it's actually a goal for the, um, a council goal this year is to update the four building project plan. Um, so that's on our list to update it with the most recent assumptions projects that obviously push back from where we were hoping they would be. Um, we hope to have better cost estimates on projects like the school and the library, or well, we have the cost estimates for the library, but better cost estimates maybe on the DPW building as well, because um, we're getting closer to having a site selected for that. So we are anticipating on updating that four building project model and then bringing it back for a presentation, I think um, makes a lot of sense. Um, and then the last question about the budget. So when we did develop the model for the four building projects, um, I looked at other school projects, um, extrapolated it to what we were thinking for this project, added in some additional funding because we knew this was gonna be a net zero. Um, so we came up with a sort of a really high level estimate of 80 million. Um, working with the OPM and the designer so far, um, they haven't done a detailed cost estimate, but the original sort of thought is that 80 million should be more than sufficient for what we're proposing at this point. Um, not to say that can't change, if things can change quickly, especially the way construction costs are, are rising. Um, but at this point, they didn't think that this increase in the feasibility study phase was going to push us over that 80 million for the whole project. Yeah. Um... I was wondering also whether we're going to have to reevaluate borrowing costs under uh, what's happening and what we're reading in the paper about interest rates. Uh, but that's a future topic to discuss. I think the one thing that, um, because, uh, you know, we keep focusing on free cash as a source of funds for the add ons. Uh, these, uh, were, these purchases originally, these amounts, the original amounts, were they funded from borrowing? So for the school project, yes, this would have been, if it's part of the 80 million, this would have been part of the borrowing and part of the debt exclusion. So um, that's being proposed. So pulling it from free cash will reduce a little bit of what would have been excluded if we um, had borrowed for it instead. It was the original plan to use uh, tissue notes or to... Uh, I'm sorry, say that again, Andy, to use what? Cash. Was, the, was the original uh, uh, amount for the, you know, the, prep, the preparation work that we're talking about was that coming from borrowing or was that coming from free cash? Were you doing the, a... Uh, the 750 uh, was I'm, borrowing. Yep, the 750 was borrowing. Um, again, we're proposing free cash for this because we're trying to keep the amount that's gonna be debt excluded as low as possible. We, we've heard the impact um, and the early feedback on trying to keep that cost down as much as possible. So looking at our reserve balance and then hearing the feedback from the committee to try to use that for these types of one-time costs that come up. Um, and then also trying to keep that amount to be debt excluded that would be passed on to the taxpayers. That's why we propose this coming from free cash instead of increasing the borrowing. But the original 750 is a borrowing. I think that uh, um, my concern here is that, uh, again, for the new members, there's a lot of terms being thrown around right now about uh, the difference between uh, borrowing and borrowing by bonds and borrowing by notes. and. Uh, what's funded from borrowing, what's funded from free cash and how they all tie together and what might be reimbursed, what that exclusion is, which is the amount of the override request that would be asked of voters. Um, these are all um, topics that are um, things that uh, we just need to have the time to in a place to explain them and uh, sort of come to um, an understanding of whether um, and those explanations should be just to the finance committee to um, 
those of you who are in the finance committee or whether other members who are um, on, on the council would like to have that kind of explanation also. Uh, but I do recognize that there is that um, whole level of complexity and uh, I um, apologize for the amount of these terms that are being thrown around without explanation and recognize that um, if you have questions, um, if you feel you'd like to have answered now about any of this or any explanation, um, you know, don't hesitate to ask. And uh, Sean or Sonia, uh, I'm sure we'll be able to um, respond. Kathy, I, you have your hand uh, up. Andy, so I just want to, um, I want to strongly endorse what you have proposed, um, not for now, but to come back to this and I think it should be the whole council Lynn if we can figure out a way to do it um I think I, it's just I have my hand up to say exactly that Kathy. I, I, I just think it shouldn't be just the finance committee it should be the whole council and it should be a dedicated conversation amount of time because I going back and forth it's not just the terms but um all of this as you look forward five years or 10 years um, has an impact on the operating budget. So it's just to understand how we're funding capital, what is debt. And uh, I think it's not just for the new counselors, but for the whole council, for existing you know, people who are still with it because it's complicated enough and interactive enough that uh, I think we need just to carve out the time. So Andy, I'd just like to add on to that we will definitely have to carve out the time, not only for the finance committee and uh, the, uh, including the uh, non-voting residents, but the entire council. And the reason we will have to carve out the time is that given the time frame for when this would probably be on the ballot, uh, it would be this council that would be brought to the question of placing a debt exclusion on the ballot. In addition to that, as uh, some of us who were at the Four Towns meeting the other day realized that now the regional schools are asking for a larger chunk of money. And Sean and others have already talked about the fact that that's going to have to be in the update of the financial model as well. So um, I hear everything you're saying I think it would be useful to stick to this question now and come back to that later. I'm ready to make a motion whenever anybody else is. Okay, let, let's see what Bernie has to say and then we'll go to a motion. Bernie? Um, quick comments. Um, the, uh, uh, you, you have to watch the headlines. Um, uh, the municipal rates, municipal borrowing is still pretty, uh, uh, municipalities can still borrow at pretty reasonable rates. Uh, so don't take the, uh, don't take the, the, uh, the headline scrolling across the banner at, on CNBC is the, uh, um, is, is the, the, the whole, there's a sum of it. The other thing is for, for anyone who wants to geek out on this, um, the Division of Local Services of the State Department of Revenue has a very uh, detailed, a uh, lot of detailed information on the website. Some of it is written for, um, uh, for folks who are new, some of it are, is written for the folks like Sonia who get to live with this for way too long. Um, but you can look at the DLS website and, and find uh, find plenty of stuff. And I, I, I do support the idea of a in depth training or discussion on this uh, with the with the committee as a whole and the council as a whole. Well, thank you, Bernie. Uh, Lynn, did you have a motion? I do. I'd like to move that we recommend that the town council approve appropriation and transfer order FY22-05E. Shane seconds. Okay, there's been a motion that's been made and seconded. Uh, we've had plenty of discussion. If there's no further discussion and I'm looking at, don't see any hands, then we will proceed in the same process as before, but this time we're starting one further down on the alphabetical list with Bernie Kubiak. I support the motion. Michelle. Aye. 
Kathy? Yes. And I vote yes. Alicia? Yes. Uh, Lynn? Uh, yes. Uh, Bob? I support the motion. And Matt? Support. Okay, so um, then again, it's unanimous with support from all three resident members of the committee. And uh, we will report it to the council as such. So with that, um, we need to uh, get back to the agenda itself. And um, we need to, um, I'm very conscious of time. So I think we need to, um, move forward uh, as best we can with items and decide what's most important. Lynn, your hand I only is have one off. request and that's of Sean and that even though we're not using borrowing in this case, we keep track of all money spent on this project regardless of the source. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so I don't know if we should uh, stay with um, the action items and go on to the um, daytime and then come back for discussion items to the extent that we have time. And uh, if that's agreeable, um, then I think that the other thing that we were going to um, put on the screen because it's a very difficult topic and uh, that is uh, just. Uh, Lynn, did, did you have the doodle poll as it actually, was posted recently? Yeah, actually, I think Sean has that. Okay, so because what we need to try and do is find a regular time for meetings. Each committee is being asked to do that. Um, and uh, as a council, we had decided that at least for the time being, the committee meetings will continue um, in the uh, virtual format that we will not be doing in-person committee meetings for the present. Um, and I think we had a date on that uh, to review that process in the spring, but uh, right now it is being done. And, I think what um, I wanted to, um, uh, you know, the, the, the problem we have is that uh, I, you know, there was no suggested time that uh, was universally avail uh, available or desired by everybody uh, on the committee. And so I was trying to uh, see if we could come up with a resolution and one possibility is whether there are additional times that were not in the original poll that uh, we ought to be considering. And I think one suggestion that was made was whether um, there'd be a time later in the afternoon after four o'clock but before six o'clock that we should be asking, we should have been asking about too and we should be considering um, and uh, but I uh, also want to recognize that um, for people who put an absolute nose into times, if um, anybody feels comfortable doing so, I'm not asking anybody to do it, but uh, certainly to um, feel free to be honest with the group about what your limitations are and why you have the limitations that you do so that we can try and balance this out in the best possible way. Uh, so is there any, uh, people should just feel free to uh, raise hands and uh, if they have any thoughts about how to proceed with this discussion. Uh, Matt? Looking at Thursday, two to four, um, I can be flexible with that if that winds up being the preference. It's, but you know, I just I wouldn't be able to engage with it for a couple of months. That's all. But I can eventually I can straighten it out. 
Michelle. I'm sorry. Can you clarify how often does this committee meet? Is it only after um, town council meetings or so every other week or? We will try and establish a schedule. If you, um, when I wrote the transfer memo uh, about the committee, uh, we generally had been meeting either once or twice a month during a large part of the year, twice a month being more frequent. Uh, but when we get into the very limited but important time after, <clears throat> excuse me, the town manager uh, submits a budget and uh, we have 30 days to respond to it, we then um, go into a larger number of meetings for a short period of time. And that usually, uh, well, doesn't, I shouldn't say even usually, that happens in May because uh, the requirement in the charter is that the town manager uh, will provide the budget uh, by May 1st at the first meeting after it is referred to the finance committee and the finance committee has 30 days after that to make a recommendation back to the council. And then the council has until June 30th to adopt the budget. So that's why that time crunch happens at that month of the year. Um, but otherwise, uh, I don't think we've um, generally met more than twice a month. Uh, it takes something pretty exceptional. Um, Bob? Yeah, I just wanted to. Yeah, I just wanted to throw out that um, I'm open any day of the week, really, between uh, from three to five or from four to six. Uh, I know that gets into some evening hours for some people, uh, but I also just want to mention that my experience has been over the last couple of years that we often go beyond the two-hour scheduled meeting time. Um, you know, I, I personally block three hours of time uh, just because sometimes the, you know, the importance discussions take longer than, than we can fit into two hours. So just bear that in mind when thinking about a, a, a meeting time. Lisa? Um, so generally, because I so I work full time and I teach classes every day, so I will never be available from two to four. Um, I think my earlier class on the day um, uh, ends at two thirty, so it's possible that maybe if we started around three, I'd be able to make that. But a two to four block is not going to work for me during a weekday. Um, my evenings are completely clear. Besides council meetings. And then generally the other time I have available to me is early mornings, like 9 a.m. I have meeting slots available. Um, those are going to be a little limited because I have the elementary school building committee, the Crest implementation team, all of which are morning meetings during the week, but is something that I can accommodate on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, if that's helpful. That is um see who else kathy well i'm just uh, i want to try to repeat back what alicia just said if if you're saying that tuesday three to five would be feasible for you um you know starting later what i'm seeing is everyone was available tuesday afternoon i am totally i could have checked every box so i i and i can do late afternoons too i just i i thought the evening real evening hours starting at six are harder on both sean and sonia um who need to be here with us and i know sean is also staffing jcpc which tends to meet in or has been meeting in the evenings we haven't done it but if we moved, I'm just looking at Tuesday, if everyone has said Tuesday two to four was okay with a three to five and if Alicia can do three to five, then we have a day that works for everyone. So I'm just, I, I needed to ask Alicia whether 
I didn't understand with the classes and the work, whether starting at three might work on a Tuesday or, or Thursday's the other day that looks like kind of almost everyone could do it um, except for Matt. But anyway, I was doing the only one missing is on Tuesday. Sorry, Kathy, I realized I did, I wasn't very clear. So I was saying Tuesday and Wednesday mornings, I could be available on Tuesday. I could still be available, but my class on Tuesday ends at three. So it would still have to be a little bit later than three on Tuesdays. I have Tuesday and Wednesday mornings. Um, on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, my class ends at 2.30. So those days I could be available at three. So I'll just say, so 3.30 is feasible. 3.30 is feasible for you on Tuesday also? Yeah, 3.30 is, that... is feasible almost every day of the week besides Friday. Okay, I, I was just asking that because for me, it it's I'm indifferent. You know, I, I didn't click any evening hours, but it wasn't because I'm not available. It's just because I was thinking of staff time. So I'll stop talking. Okay. Anybody want to and I should take my hand? Um, is there any any other questions or suggestions to have? Otherwise, uh, Kathy, do you have a recommendation out of all of that? Yeah, I, I'm thinking what I see on the grid. If we made it Tuesday from three thirty to five thirty, we are unanimous that that works. Unless um, I, I'm just speaking for myself, for the people who said it was okay if we start later and end before six, does that work for them? So I, I just would look to the rest of the group, not just for myself, but we get to 10 people if we, if that works for everyone. Andy, can I just ask a quick question? Yes. Alicia, does 3.30 give you enough time um, or would four o'clock be better? Three o'clock could work if, if that's what works better for everybody. 3.30, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So um, if, if we want to see if Tuesday at 3.30 to 5.30 works, why don't we do this, um, Bob? Yeah, uh, I was going to suggest 3.30 might be better because of what I said earlier. We often spill over a little bit. So if people can go from 3.30 to 6 without you know, stressing out, that, that, that might be more realistic. We set a goal of 3.30 to 5.30, Bob, but it leaves us a spillover if we have to, right? That's, yeah, that was my yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. There was the one suggestion that I was going to make is that um, we order the agendas for all future meetings so that uh, I work with uh, Sean, Sonia, and uh, Kathy, his vice chair, to determine what are the most critical items and uh, if we have to um, set a hard stop time, which are the ones that can carry over and we put those at the end of the agenda and we let our agenda flow by uh, what we think are the most critical issues. Bernie? Yeah, if um, uh, Alicia believes that a half an hour is enough time for her to stop teaching and switch gears. That's great. And I agree with Bob that if we, uh, we, we, you know, kind of leave that uh, option of 530 to six open because we do run over from time to time. And I know I'm a sometime contributor to that. Um, Matt? I'm uh, sorry to say this since we're so close to a solution here, but you know, something during the workday I can work around or something in the evening I can, I can plan for something, right. I have a, I have a long commute and a young child and that, you know, if, if that's really the only solution this group can come up with, then I, I'll proceed with it. But it is, that is um, probably the worst possible, that overlap of the, of the commute time is probably the worst possible time for me. So I, I don't know if, if anybody has thought about possibly alternating, um, you know, in a morning and an evening or, or 
something like that. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I, I apologize because I know we're very close to a solution here, but that it really couldn't pick a worse slot of time for me. Okay, well, this is what we need to consider. Um, when you say commute time, what um, are you thinking of exactly the time we're talking about? Yeah, that's that's pretty much right in my sweet spot of getting home and getting my kid to bed and then being able to attend. Like the, the cultural council, we do our meetings in the evening, six to eight. You know, this was an afternoon meeting. Um, it's, again, you know, if this is the best thing the group can do, then I'll, I'll make do with it. It's just, it's, a, it's not a great spot for me. So we can come to Bob. Yeah, what about... Wednesdays at 9 a.m. We all made it this week. Is it difficult for people to make that on a regular basis? We'll ask that question in a second. Uh, Alicia? I was just wondering if you might be able to bring back up the, uh, the doodle poll for the schedule. That was a little helpful, but I could, I can do Wednesdays at 9. I just thought it would be helpful to see this and also just um, resonating with what Matt said, because I completely understand I also have a work commute and children. So that time is slightly difficult, um, but depending on the frequency of our meetings, I could make that happen. And then also, I know Michelle asked this question. I'm not sure if I was clear on the answer because I know the frequency of us meeting changes. So right now, are we looking to be meeting? What is our frequency of meeting right now? Right now, we're on, uh, based upon experience, we'll, we would be meeting every other week, probably until uh, May or very close to the 1st of May. And then we would get into that very short period where we have more frequent meetings because of the 30-day timeline for responding to the town manager's proposed budget. Okay, and just to, I, I'm not sure if this will matter, but in May, because schools will be out, I won't have the same teaching schedule after that. So it might be different, but for right now, um, that's my limitation. But you um, would be available. I, I may, we'll be asking this of everybody, so you don't need to actually answer right now about the Wednesday 9 to 11. Yes. Okay, Bernie. Yeah, Wednesdays are difficult for me because um, I'm childcare. Um, if my partner's around, then she will sometimes graciously she can I can get her to sub for me, but um, there's no guarantee that I could be here reliably on Wednesdays until school's up. Are there other days of the week, or is that true for every day? Um, that's true for Wednesdays. The other days of the week, I have some flexibility. I also have other other things that I do, but um, so the, uh, the most of which I can move around. Um, what about Tuesday at that time, Michelle? I was, that's what I, I was going to ask Alicia, just to clarify if 9 a.m.'s every, if a 9 a.m. any morning, but Friday was, or I, I'm sorry if I, I, I misheard that, Alicia, but was a 9 a.m. good for you any morning? Yeah, I'm sorry. My schedule is a little confusing, but um, every morning except for Friday, There's Thursday and Friday, because Thursday I have Crest implementation and Friday I have elementary school building committee. Um, but so I essentially have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at 9 a.m. open. Great. So um, why don't I ask um, anybody who has problems with 9 a.m. on Tuesdays to raise their hands and uh, let's see if we of anybody who has a problem with that time. So I don't see any. 
Um, are there and uh, if there are any schedule, is there any schedule that we need to work around to um, make Tuesday nine to eleven work? Uh, occasional meetings or things like that. Otherwise, uh, what we should try and do in uh, for the next meeting, um, I'll work with uh, Kathy and Sean and come up with a list of Tuesdays and propose it back at the next um, meeting in order to um, confirm a schedule for the time um, going forward, Lynn. I'm going to suggest that in order to avoid potentially running into having TSO and finance on the same day of the week or day of the calendar, I should say, that this uh, committee meet the next time on either February 25th or February, I'm, I'm sorry, January 25th or February 8th at nine o'clock. Yes. Um, I mean, the, well, the time that was being considered by TSO was in the evening, as I recall from last night. Right. But the first time that TSO is meeting is February 1st, which means we would start this at nine in the morning and have another meeting that night. So, unless it's urgent, the Finance Committee could wait until February 8th. Eight. So um, I think that's actually a good suggestion, Kathy. I, and, uh, I like that, I like that, Lynn, because it also will get us on a schedule. We're meeting the day after the council meeting. Although, as you know, when you look at the council calendar, sometimes we don't meet on a Monday because it's a holiday or it's something, but right. if, if that becomes every other week, I will just book it and then we can change it when we need to. But that, and that also gives us that meeting next week. To me, we need to figure out the next meeting in a way, um, the content of it. And I don't think we have a, fin Sean and Sonia will know whether we have anything that has to be decided between now and the eighth. If not, then, mm -hmm we can have more time to figure out the agendas as well, rather than meeting again next week. Yeah, well, I don't think there's anything that needs to be decided. We'll have quarterly reports ready for the eighth, the first and second quarter financial reports. Oh, um, that would be that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the eighth, I think next week would be is, is gonna be kind of tight, but the eighth would be perfect, I think. I'm saying that for Sonia and she's probably gonna shake her, her fist at me, but oh, there, thumbs up, great. So okay, I think so um, yeah, we have an agreement then that the next meeting of this committee after we adjourn today will be on February 8th, Tuesday at nine o'clock in the morning, and that uh, we will uh, propose a schedule for consideration of Tuesdays for meetings to take us uh, through the end of April and an agenda for the next meeting. We'll work on that too. And if that's agreeable, I don't think we need, it. we can just do it by agreement. I don't think this necessarily has to be done by motion unless uh, someone just wants to do it by motion. No, it does not. Okay. So I think that we have a, uh, and thank you very much for everybody because this was a, a difficult topic. I mean, we all have uh, a lot of things we're trying to do. And uh, so the flexibility is very helpful. As far as the discussion items are concerned um, and uh, knowing the amount of time that we have left, because I actually do want to try and stick with the uh, two hour things. Um, Let's uh, see if, and, and the other thing I need to do is um, check to see if there's any public, because we also have to uh, allow time for public comment. I think there's one member of the public 
present and um, if that um, person would like to um, offer public comment at this meeting, then I would um, like, uh, can you uh, bring Tony Cunningham into the meeting and uh, then we can have, uh, uh, welcome Tony and uh, if you have comment, uh, usually we try and limit it to three minutes, but we appreciate hearing from you. Morning. Good morning, uh, Tony Cunningham. I live in Owen Drive. I'm sorry, I was in a work meeting for the last hour, so I'm sorry if this already got discussed and I missed it. Um, I had a question about regional schools capital requests. Um, last night at the school committee meeting, they discussed uh, the track and fields projects, and there seemed to be a desire to pursue the more expensive <clears throat> of three options, which is close to $5 million. And then I noticed in the packet for the four towns meeting, there was also talk of middle school and high school fire suppression improvements, which is also pegged at $5 million. And then separately to that, there's the middle school roof, which was authorized 3 million, I think it was a couple of years ago, but they're waiting on MSBA approval for hopefully half of that. So in theory, you know, that adds up to quite a chunk. And I know Amherst doesn't pay the whole amount, but the, the portion that would be on, that Amherst would be on the hook for could, could in theory be many millions of dollars. And I know it doesn't go through JCPC for the regional schools. So I'm, I'm wondering when does that get talked about and where does that money come from if it's gonna be a borrowing with debt service, for example, you know, over 10 years? And, and is there room in the capital budget, bearing in mind debt repayments will become due on the library project and the school project and there will be roads and other demands on the limited capital budget? Would the regional school, the portion, Amherst portion of those regional school projects also have to come out of that same capital budget? And is there room in that capital budget for those projects? I hope that's clear. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question, Tony, and the comment. Uh, and uh, I just want to note that on the discussion items list uh, of four items, one of them is the regional school funding and four towns meeting. And uh, so, uh, while we don't always uh, respond when public comment um, is uh, comes forward in, in the meeting, we uh, probably will come back to this issue in a few minutes in that uh, discussion item. But thank you very much for your comment and bringing it forward. And uh, with that in mind, I saw um, Michelle, you had briefly your hand up. I don't know if you want to be recognized or um, otherwise let's try and uh, talk briefly about each of the discussion items. And again, I'm keeping my eye on the time and trying to stay to the two hours that um, and, and not go into the additional overtime that um, we've been warned about. Uh, so um, since there are no hands up at the, at the beginning, I think that the uh, question of the transition memo and items carried over from the previous session is a standard item that was put on all um, committee meetings. But um, what I really would like to turn it into, because I think we uh, the, the transfer memo was a little bit different from um, the other committees because, uh, you know, the, it's just the nature of finance that we work through projects, but uh, um, I'd like to establish a list of things that we would like to see on the agenda uh, for meetings over the next few months prior to when we really have to delve back into the budget. And uh, I open it for suggestions of those items. Um, one thing that, uh, or two things that I, uh, have observed and I want to um, at least make sure that somebody at least mentions them if they think that we should do so is uh, the water sewer rate questions and uh, parking uh, revenue for the trans for the transportation fund. Uh, 
other issues. Yes, Lynn. Uh, I, I think you're going in the absolutely right direction, Andy. Uh, I think the extent to which uh, we can look at items that are either need to be looked at um, with more depth in advance of the budget uh, would be useful. So for example, are we going to look at CPA uh, recommendations? And I believe they're ready, correct, Sean? And so that's one that we can also look at between now and May 1st. And then the other ones you just brought up, I think are excellent. And if there's other kind of issues that are not, if you will, part of the regular budget, then I think we should focus on those between now and May uh, 1st. And then in addition, obviously I'll be putting together um, working with you all to um, what that primer, if you will, for the town council will be about financing capital projects, um, all of those wonderful terms we slung around earlier today and um, so forth. What was the first one you mentioned? Um, CPA. Oh. Which I believe yes. they have completed their recommendations. And so we could do that anytime between now and before May 1st. Okay. Um, Kathy? Yeah, and I, Lynn, my memory, but you, you will know this. Um, usually the CPA comes to the council and we refer to finance to, to review. So if we're meeting the day after the finance, the council meeting on, it's that first week in February, it's perfect to be on that agenda then. You know, we could be looking at it early. So that was one comment on timing. The other is, um, Sean will know where this is, but we, I raised the issue and I was told we're working on it. And then I sent a memo in on parking fees, uh, meters, parking policies, permitting for parking and you know, I know the staff was working on coming up with a revision. Um, I, I think it would be good to see, it's one of your out of cycle land, you know, that it won't come up in the budget, but I think it would be good to try to see where you are on it. And then again, I think it's gotta to come to the council first and then be referred, referred there, because- There is a substantial parking item planned for Monday, the 24th. Okay, with fees? I Sean, yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, so then that potentially is another natural. And then the, the last one is one that we've had a couple meetings, but we didn't get very far. We talked about, Bernie was in them with me with uh, Guilford on water and sewer. Um, and if we want to change in any way the way we do that, and this wouldn't be for the coming year at this point, it would just be we raised the question on um, quarterly rates. And so if we try to schedule that, I'd like to do it not when we're dealing water and sewer next year's rates. I'd like to do it in its own separate meeting. Um, so that was the other one I had that is kind of unfinished business. We had raised, we'd started to look at it. And even if we want to put it to bed, you know, that we're not going to do anything, I'd like to have a discussion. Michelle. Yep. Um, so if there are former or current town committees that have made recommendations or will be making recommendations, um, such as the Community Safety Working Group and the African Heritage Reparation Assembly, how do those uh, sorts of um, conversations get added to an agenda? I think that's what we're I, and just being a, new, a newbie here i'm sorry i'm not i i don't know sort of the, the process and the way that it works um so it would just be helpful 
not specifically to discuss those recommendations or those committees, but just to understand how the process works generally. Um, I mean, some of that comes up, uh, came up through the discussion of the guidelines. Uh, and that because it, it had needs, needed to be fit into the larger scope of planning. Some of it comes up individually. Uh, I don't think that we've, uh, we certainly have had a detailed discussion in planning around CSWG um, recommendations because they were built in at least for the first year. Uh, Kathy and Lynn, uh, which I had taken that, that order, Kathy? Uh, I was just gonna say that in general, Michelle, and I'll use climate action committee as they, to the extent it has a budget impact, the committee, gets those to Paul as part of the budget process so that we in finance then see it in a consolidated budget. We don't deal with those because it's got to be worked in within the guidelines that were set. Um, so we, that has been the general route. Um, you know, there have been some exceptions, you know, and so the things we, but we haven't done um, specified ass as much um, it, in finance, they've gone because we we have an overall policy setting piece, but Paul has to bring us a budget that works. Um, so that has been the root, um, and that and then, for example, then in JCPC, which is the capital place, um, the issues of hybrid trucks and different kinds of solar or an allocation, they came as specific requests. Um, but often from departments and sometimes from residents, but we didn't see them, you know, so it, it came through a process that came through the budget piece. So I'll, I mean, we can talk a little bit more about that maybe at the next meeting, but it's been a rooting through Paul because he's got to make it fit. And council sets the overall mm -hmm. policy guidelines, you know, and, and, and big picture, but then there's the reality of how much money we have. Thank you, Kathy. Right. Helpful. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just going to set that in uh, in the context of a calendar. So we've already done the initial uh, fiscal indicators back in the beginning of middle of November, and on the same night um, we also had public forum. Uh, Michelle, I believe you made extensive comments at that public forum. I would hope that you would forward them to the full council and to Paul. And uh, with regard to the CSWG, that conversation has been ongoing now for a while. Uh, there, the um, motion that was made uh, a year ago, well, in the budget that we're now in, was also then, I believe, continue that into the next fiscal year. And I do wanna call attention to the fact that Alicia and the implementation team will be doing two public forums on what's coming up with the CREST program, which is one of the main features of the um, uh, CSWG recommendations. So, but after that, we then did the budget guidelines, which we did not include in this packet, and we need to just to make sure that people have them. And then Paul basically starts the budget process, and he's doing that already with Sean, um, and get, you know, collecting data from departments and collecting data from all of the recommendations. And then that is what comes to us in the form of a proposed budget on May 1st. And on May 2nd, Paul will make his budget presentation to the town council. And there is an automatic referral to the finance committee at that point. And that's when we begin the process of the in-depth look at the budget. So um, those are issues that are in people's minds. They're on the um, on the slate, if you will, uh, and uh, they may not all get implemented, but it's out there. Okay, so I think that that's a, gives you a sense of kind of the timing and why we went through that indicators back in November and the budget forum back in November as well. Okay, Michelle. 
I appreciate that. That's really helpful. And yeah, just, I, I did, we did make comments um, uh, during the forum and then I did attend the finance committee that was following that uh, and, and watched, uh, I think the, the second meeting following that. And there really wasn't uh, too much of a discussion about the recommendations that the AHRA made. Um, and I know we're working through a process here. And um, so, I, I just, it's, it's more about trying to understand how to actually um, get these conversations to happen uh, when they need to happen and the timing that they need to happen in. And I know that it's, um, they're not easy conversations to have and there is much demand on the budget. And I, I completely understand that. Um, I just, I, I, I wanna make sure that in that case with reparations, there wasn't much of a conversation that occurred. Um, and there really wasn't much that was added into the draft guidelines either um, with respect to it. So whatever now Paul and Sean are looking at doesn't, it, it you know, those, those recommendations really haven't been um, addressed. And so, and maybe they're not gonna be addressed right now and that's okay and we're working through a process, but I just, I wanna understand how, how we can have that conversation. Okay, so here's where I think we're at as far as identifying items to try and um, include in agendas over the next months before we get to the uh, uh, May 1st uh, crunch period. And um, if I've missed them, please, uh, missed anything, please speak up. But one is uh, water sewer fund, um, uh, how we establish rates and alternative mechanisms for establishing rates. Another is a bundle of parking issues, which I think Kathy described. Uh, we wanna make sure we get the Community Preservation Act um, uh, done. We want to, uh, because there'll be rec there are recommendations from that committee, and it has to go through finance to the council as the next steps. Uh, we talked about making sure that um, we uh, do some planning for the full council and for the committee about um, how the capital planning process is going to work and. Um, trying to explain a little bit more about how um, borrowing and um, fits in and just working in terminology around borrowing so that um, we get everybody into the same place and understanding those issues and um, funding for um, some of the initiatives that we've talked about in addition to reparations to CSWG, there's ECAC. Did I miss anything? Because if not, um, I'm remaining conscious of the time. Um, and the next item on that discussion list was uh, council retreat discussion. And uh, I think uh, Kathy or Lynn can uh, pick up on this a little bit, but just to give you a real quick, is that, uh, there was a thought um, about uh, trying to do some kind of budget presentation. Um, and Kathy was, uh, uh, had offered to work on that issue and uh, is, uh, to try and then have it presented, I think, at the next finance committee meeting on the 8th, as far as what the general outline of it would be which would be done immediately, immediately prior to the retreat itself um, for where the council is having a retreat, I think on the following Saturday. So uh, I don't know if Kathy or uh, Lynn have anything to add to that. The retreat is on the 12th. I, since I'm trying to pull the, together the retreat agenda, I'm trying to understand more what this recommendation is. Kathy, have you done any uh, more thinking about how you would, what you wanted to present? Uh, and well, my, my thought was, and when, when, when I say this 
Sean will just blanch, but um, but my thought was if we could have just a few charts to say what is the what is where's the money come from, where's the money go to, you know, and I thought of a, sort of a budget reality and then show out five years. I just wanted to have a grounding of what we're up against, you know, unless, you know, um, I always feel like, you know, I watch the federal news and boy, wouldn't that infrastructure bill be nice? Wouldn't that, you know, solar energy piece? But we, we've got a very tight budget, particularly with the capital projects and debt service coming online for big projects. So I, what I had in mind, Andy, is like, a few pie chart kinds of things, and then at least one, two tables for uh, maybe a 20 minute presentation, but just an orientation, not a lot of discussion. And I don't know whether that's possible. I did one once in 2018, just after I'd been elected with our local district, we had a district meeting and um, I made it simple, you know, I and it was just to, show people where the money comes from and where it goes. Um, so is this something, Kathy, that you're proposing to do at a finance committee meeting? Or is well, this I thought, no, I thought I'm during sorry, the reading. May I finish my question, please? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Is this something that you're proposing for a finance committee meeting? Or is this something you're asking that it be on the agenda for the retreat? Because I didn't know that we were doing that. Okay. Okay. I had originally, Lynn, proposed it for the retreat. If we think we can't do it at the retreat, where we don't have room for it, but one of the things we were supposed to be talking about at the retreat was our priorities, right. and and to the extent any of the priorities have dollar signs next to them, um, I would just like to make sure we're doing it from a foundation of of the town of the town of Amherst. Um, so my original suggestion was the re focused on the retreat, Lynn, and if. If we just can't do it that way, I would understand, but I, yes. Let, let me look at that agenda. The other possibility is that this be part of that dedicated uh, meeting for the full town council and um, the public and our non-voting members all about finance. And I think that's fine. It's just the, with the retreat is the 12th. So I, you know, it, it's just, I found that grounding really helpful to me to understand why we were faced with such hard choices. Um, and I said, if, if I do this here, how does it impact something over there? Um, unless I found um, someone who wanted to give Amherst a few million dollars. So, yeah. Got it. Thank you. Anything else here? In, um, the uh, question about future agenda items, which is D on that discussion item, most we've really been handling as we've talked about um, A and B. So uh, spend a couple minutes on the four town meeting. Uh, I think a number of us were present at the four town meeting. It is a uh, difficult topic. Um, Tony Cunningham raised uh, an issue that um, I think that those of us who attended the meeting are well aware of that adds to the operating budget side of the Fort Town meeting. Um, but basically, uh, there are two things that happen in regional schools. And uh, one is that uh, there has to be an agreement amongst the four towns on the budget as a whole, how much is being spent for um, education at the middle school, high school level. And then the other is uh, the portion that has to be paid for by the towns that is not coming from other funds, state funds uh, and, and grants, uh, how that gets divided up amongst the four towns, which is really what the most contentious set of issues were at that meeting. And uh, I don't know that we can go into a long process about it. Um, I do. Um, want to offer for uh, new members of the committee, uh, if you're interested to set up, uh, to either have a phone conversation about it, 
maybe a group phone conversation with a smaller number of people to just answer your questions and bring everybody up to speed on that issue. But uh, it is a uh, um, difficult and complex topic that a uh, number of us, Sean in particular, have been living with for uh, seems like our whole lives. Um, Lynn? And there will be another Four Towns meeting. We just don't know when, sometime in February. And we will need to make sure that we have a further discussion item on this prior to the Fort Town meeting. Um, and as far as the uh, capital piece to it, I don't know if you have anything more to add, Sean. Um, sure. The, so, uh, so. Um, so the way regional schools do capital is the school district will bring a capital request to their school committee. And then if the school committee approves it, it will then get sent to all four towns and the towns have so many days to either act on it or not act on it. Um, it requires all four towns to approve. So if, for, let's just use, for example, if they approve the track this year, um, it'll come to each town to consider. So for the smaller towns, it would go to their town meetings. For us, it would go to the council. Um, and then ultimately that gets routed back to finance committee um, to discuss. But all four towns have to agree if any town um, votes it down, then it goes back to the school committee um, to consider. And the cost of those capital projects gets split up to the member towns based on um, equalized valuations, which is basically property values in each town. That's how they, they split it between Amherst, Pelham, Leverett, and Shutesbury. Um, and I think that's the other major takeaway from the four town meeting is there was a large increase in capital, not only the track, but as the, um, as the public commenter mentioned, the roof and, and lots of other projects that um, result in a really large increase in the capital assessment that we pay to the region. So when we pay to the funds to the region, we pay an operating assessment and then a capital assessment. Um, and so the capital assessment was projected to rise pretty sharply in the next five years. Um, and so we're going to have to work with them to figure out a way to make it manageable um, for us, but also to meet the needs of the of the region, which has two pretty large buildings. And uh, the capital, as we do our general consolidated budget, uh, capital portion um, comes out of the capital portion of the town budget. Right. So if we set aside 10% of the, the levy for capital, which is what we, we hope to do this year, um, off the top of that comes our debt, whatever the town's debt is for, for general fund projects. Um, but also what comes off the top is the regional school capital assessment. Um, so that directly impacts what the town has for its own capital projects. Um, and again, just going back to the way capital is authorized. So once once the capital project is brought to the school committee, if the towns approve it, that's the last time the towns see it. If it turns to debt, then the towns have to pay their, their debt assessment for that project, um, which might come three years down the road. But um, once it's approved by the council and the, and the other three towns, then it's, it's, the funding is approved. Yeah, um, let's say one thing and then recognize Kathy, because actually this is getting into JCPC territory is what I'm gonna say. And Kathy is an, uh, one of the council members of JCPC. And that is that uh, the, to the extent that uh, the recommendation as was noted by uh, comment, uh, Tony's comment, was to uh, do a more complex um, project and that there was a request not only um, that uh, it be done as a, as a regional project, but that Amherst pay an additional amount. Um, if you really went down that path, um, it really cuts into what JCPC has as a total amount to recommend for other capital needs within the town. And I assume therefore uh, we would need to have JCPC um, discussing that issue also. Kathy, 
now I'll turn it back to you since you're no, talking. No, no, so Andy, you, you said that piece, and I just, I actually had a question um, for smaller, for capital that doesn't get debt financed by the regional, do we see it in a line item? Um, so, or is it rolled into the overall regional budget? Because I, when I look at the budget, I see regional debt service. Um, so that I'm just asking as a question. Yeah. Um, so if, if it's not, we'll see anything that's assessed to us. So if it's, if it's part of their capital plan and they approve it um, as such, uh, it will come to us in, as an assessment. Um, looking at the regional agreement, pretty much everything that comes to as an assessment has to be debt financed. Even if it's little stuff, they usually bundle it into a bigger package. Um, okay. So so pretty much everything that comes to us is, is debt financed either through most of the time through a bond anticipation note. Um, they may never convert it to long-term debt, but it, it usually has to be at least financed um, through some sort of debt to start with. Okay, that was my understanding. I just want to make sure I did, because yeah. if, you, if anyone wants to look at our budgets, there is a line for regional capital, um, you know, but we don't in JCPC or in the past, we haven't seen little pieces of it. You know, we've just, we've been given, this is, as Andy said, this is how much is left over after we pay that debt service and other debt service. This is how much we've got for this coming year. Um, so we're not seeing in advance next year what's coming to us as individual projects. We're seeing them as, uh, it, it, it's in a different, you, you explained it well, Sean, where else we're, we're seeing it as a council. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, um, the timing may be perfect for what we're talking about, um, that they brought it up early enough that um, some of this discussion probably ought to happen at JCPC. And uh, I don't know who's going to be chair of that committee, but um, when it, it needs to uh, make it would be helpful to have that input because we're talking about how we divide up our that 10% that we allow from for capital. Um, so looking at the time and trying to be very conscious of it, um, we've had general public comment. Uh, what, the thing about minute process that uh, what I just um, want to conclude that is, is that um, uh, with a proposal that uh, we do what other standing committees nor have done and take the pressure off of a single member of the uh, committee, who has been Kathy, um, to review the minutes and just have um, draft minutes cert, uh, given to the committee and have uh, so that everybody has a chance to read them. Be, uh, and offer corrections even the, either in advance of the meeting or um, if need be at the meeting and approve uh, minutes at meetings and uh, make that a committee function for this year. Uh, and if there's no objection to that, and I'll look at hands raised this counting as objections, then we'll just go forward with the um, changing it over to that standard process. And seeing nothing coming up, um, I have no announcements. I don't know if our, our items were not anticipated. I don't know if anybody else has. We've talked about the next agenda already in the meeting. So um, I'll just give, pause for a moment to see if any hands go up about any of those items, other items to be discussed things people would like to announce. Otherwise, um, we'll be ready to adjourn. So seeing none, then uh, I uh, thank everybody. Uh, uh, and uh, we're adjourned. And we will reconvene at our next meeting uh, at 9 AM on February 8th. Thank, thank you. you.